Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the next seminar in uh, the Geary Institute for Public Policy Seminar Series. Uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Julian Merciel from the School of Geography in UCD. Julian's research uh, interests include the marketization of health and social care systems, social policy, uh, critical uh, public uh, political economy, and geopolitics. So today, uh, Julian's going to present some work to us that he's done recently on home care, the growth of private providers. And again, a reminder to the audience that questions for Julian um, should be addressed through the Q&A format, and we will come to them at the end of Julian's presentation. So Julian, without further ado, over to you. Thank you. Hello. OK, thanks uh, for, for coming. So uh, I've been working on the home care for a couple of years or so, and looking at um, how the, the sector has changed, it has changed a lot in terms of um, the growth of private providers, which is the focus of my, uh, my work now. So uh, I'll talk about uh, what I have done, what I have found, and uh, a few things as, as well that I'm trying to push the work towards. And, um, I like to present this, uh, part of it is somewhat finished in the sense that the research is done, but uh, also as an open-ended project that um, people who are listening today could actually suggest um, maybe answers or ways of proceeding. Because there's not too many people working at all on, the, on home care, let alone on the private side sector, uh, uh, on the private sector side because uh, maybe it's a small uh, sector, it's a small country. So there's quite a few issues that we're not too sure about. And at some point I'll raise those issues, but it doesn't mean I have the answers at all. Um, so, okay. Um, just to contextualize all this, which is quite important in terms of European long-term care because um, to, to understand Ireland, uh, really, it helps if you see where, where we fit. So there's, in the literature, there's kind of two trajectories that are identified for marketization trends. In the, we're talking about Europe here um, since the last 30 years or so. So one is that uh, universalistic models uh, became more uh, restricted so countries like uh, Scandinavia is the classic example or countries where they have a, a good NHS type of system like England, they've marketized those systems become a more uh, bigger uh, role for the private sector to play uh, maybe more um, cash for care type of uh, market based um, schemes to to uh, provide uh, home care, social care. So restricted universalism is what we have now uh, for, for those uh, models. And the second trajectory is the residual models. So that was more uh, continental Europe, uh, Southern Europe in particular. And those ones have in a way gone the other direction. They've moved more towards universalism where Whereas before they were more residual, like it was less um, um, generous as a system. So you didn't have the same entitlements, for example, as in the universalistic uh, models. Uh, but they've moved more towards universalism by expanding coverage in many ways, either by making more people uh, eligible for certain uh, services, either by offering more services or, you know, in general, getting more towards there. So the result is that you have um, those two trends and there's a, you can look at convergence or divergence in some ways, but that's where um, uh, it is. And there's a lot of diversity as ever in Europe. So those are, you can always kind of argue <laughs> about those two trends, but that's kind of, a, I find a good way to look at it. Now, uh, where does Ireland fit in this? Well, as usual, Ireland uh, doesn't fit really neatly in one or the other, which is what is interesting. Uh, so 
traditionally, we've had a residual system um, with the laissez-faire state, uh, which wasn't you know, an active state, which would provide all sorts of home care services. Uh, and again, that's a question of degree. Like we had some state services, we've had that, but it's a matter of the, the extent of, of that provision that we're talking about. Um, Family-based as well, which is another um, feature of the Irish uh, system. A lot of the home care relies on uh, just families uh, taking care of their uh, uh, family members who, who need it. And then there's a, a series of uh, government uh, supports for that. Uh, and so in a way, it's similar to Southern Europe in many ways. It's like um, the Southern uh, European country of the North, if you want to put it that way. Um, but also with the kind of UK style marketization uh, with a lot of private providers and market-based type of system. So it's in between. And I think one broader project than what I'm presenting today would really be to slot iron in a way in the, in the home care uh, in the home care landscape in in Europe. Um, so one uh, thing that really is um, important in Ireland, uh, especially compared to um, to other Southern European countries or on the continent is really the significance of private providers. Uh, they really are important in the landscape here. And it's a rather recent development, like it's not been here for that many years. We'll, we'll see that throughout the presentation. Um, so in um, European long-term care, home care especially, there's been the literature on, on marketization is rather extensive at, at this stage, um, but the focus is a lot on um, the policies, uh, for example, you know, cash for care has gotten a lot of attention or who gets what. And I was really struck when I started reading about that, that the actual private providers themselves, okay, they're, it's not that people don't know they're there, but um, there's not much data on them. There is not much um, interpretation of how um, they operate, uh, why they grow. Uh, that might be a bit different in uh, maybe in Scandinavia or the UK because they've been also very important, but many countries that are similar to Ireland, you'd have papers written about, uh, okay, we've marketized uh, care and using this cash for care scheme and this and that. And uh, then you'll have two or three lines literally saying, um, okay, um, private providers have become more important. You don't know if they've become more important by 10% or if they've doubled in size or what happened, why, who are they uh, anyway, you know, what kind of companies they are. Uh, so I like to focus on, on business just because I think if you understand how business operates, you understand a lot of what's going on in, in, well, in society, but in this case, in, um, in the sector of, uh, of home care. So that's kind of what I try to do. And at this stage, we're at the beginning of that research because um, I've only started, like I said, about a year or two ago. And because data is not very good as we'll see in Ireland, it's just a, one hurdle we have to go through. But that's the, um, the angle uh, that uh, I'm adopting. Now, a bit of a theory here, uh, if we want to understand um, the sources of business power, uh, why are um, private providers uh, getting more important in Ireland, maybe they'll become even more important. And why have they risen so uh, drastically in such a short period of time? Uh, in the literature, which is more in the political economy, business studies side, you can have three types of reasons or angles. Um, one is structural. So that's to say that um, business and the corporate sector um, they, uh, they're so important to the economy that structurally in society and the economy, they, they will have inherently some kind of uh, leverage or power over what's going on because 
governments know that they depend on them so much for a good economy that you know you you don't even need to make a call to the prime minister or to Taoiseach to uh, to influence anything it, it kind of goes uh, like that uh, so we'll see some aspects of that uh, in, in the situation in Ireland and the second one uh, source of business power is more instrumental so that's more about uh, lobbying so we know that let's say uh, a business lobby is uh, well organized and they have good connections and they make donations maybe to you know, this or that group in the public sector or they just meet with them and then uh, they get a kind of influence policy in that way that's the stuff we would see more in the newspapers for example uh, so that's quite important as well in some uh, contexts uh, and i'll talk a little bit about that again in uh, the case i'm in, interested in Another one which is quite interesting and probably somewhat more relevant to uh, my work now is uh, an institutional source of business power. So it's been presented um, rather recently. Um, the general idea is not necessarily that new, but um, to, to address it in that literature is um, kind of a nice uh, contribution there. So. Overall, it says that when the private sector uh, comes to deliver public services, um, over time, they, they kind of displace the, um, the public sector in that way. And then what happens is that uh, you have an institutional entrenchment of the private sector. And um, over time, um, key stakeholders in society you know, readjust themselves to that new presence of private providers. And so you have feedback effects. So let's say an easy example would be, um, you know, you have a new sector education or something that's more delivered privately over the years. And you'll see political parties, for example, uh, or trade unions who will adjust to that uh, because uh, they, um, they don't have a choice in a way. They, it's a new player and um, you know, the, the whole system changes like that. And that means that decisions now start to be taken um, in function of that. And then you have a feedback because business gets more considered in decisions and it can increase their power even more. So they get entrenched even more. So that's the idea there. And, of course, you can see already that it's quite uh, nice to, this, to use that concept to talk about outsourcing and privatization the way I'm going to talk about, because it's kind of what's happening in, uh, in Ireland. So there's three ways that we can uh, talk about this, how this happens in terms of process or mechanism. Uh, that's from uh, the Busmeier and uh, Thelen article. Again, we can think of others, maybe other um, processes. But those, I think, kind of cover some of the main ways. So number one, a process of delegation. Um, that's when the state uh, decides kind of consciously to say, OK, we're going to outsource this service to the private guys. And that's it for whatever reason. So voluntary. And then the private sector picks up from that. Number two, deregulation is more when the state kind of withdraws from uh, a given sector and then it gives space to private uh, businesses to take over the, the demand, to meet the demand, and it happens like that. Not so much because the state actively targeted them. Sorry, uh, there's a dog here interested in home care. And um, it happens like this. So, Passive displacement in a way. Number three, accretion is when you really have a situation where the private sector uh, is actively kind of uh, pushing away the state, like trying to encroach on public sector uh, delivery. And they really, maybe through their organizations or whatever, they will uh, really take the lead and uh, implement themselves. Right? So those three um, mechanisms are what's outlined there. And my goal here is kind of to see which ones, plural or singular, um, 
explain the Irish situation in the, in the case of home care, which is a really, really nice case study because, like I said, it's happened so drastically and so quickly that you really have a defined case study. It's not maybe that much about you know long-term historical trends or something like that. It's really happened for specific reasons. So how did I do that? Well, first of all, I should have specified um, I did this work uh, with a master's student who is now a PhD student working on similar topic, uh, Nick O'Neill. Uh, so uh, all that data work was done by, by him and myself together. Um, so just to show how the data is rather poor in, in Ireland and with the HSC, so far, the best we could find is that the commercial sector in home care had quadrupled in size uh, from 2000 to 2010 or so. That was what everybody was repeating in the literature that's rather small on this. Uh, but we didn't know, you know, quadruple like what, a number of uh, providers uh, in numbers of clients or hours delivered or money or anything like that. And if you if you chase down that reference about the quadruple, it's back to a documentary on TV that I think Primetime uh, aired uh, in 2010. So I didn't watch a documentary, I stopped my research there, but it all came from that. So again, you could see that it wasn't very clear. Everybody knows that the private providers have grown, but in what way, where, and how much, it was a bit uh, nebulous. So. The official data we have, uh, again, it's all mixed up because um, official is that what it says on the second point, official data. Uh, some of them, uh, for some stats series, they count the number of hours delivered in home care. Other, for other types of services, they count the number of recipients. They don't care about adjusting or <laughs> making it match. Others uh, prevent, present you from some data that there's no distinction between private and nonprofit providers or HSC. It's not really categorized. So you don't really know, okay, you know how much home care we deliver, but you don't know who does it. Um, sometimes too, you have a HCP is the home care packages, which has been the form that um, has grown a lot versus home help, which is again, may or may be distinguished, but sometimes it's not. So you don't really know uh, what it is. Uh, that we're looking at in for for in systematic terms. So what we had to do was really go through that data and um, organize it pretty well and uh, systematically. And um, what we decided to do was to use public spending data because the money is actually tracked uh, somewhat systematically, um, and uh, that's what we used. And I'll, I'll show you the results, of course, and also interviews uh, mostly with the private sector uh, providers, but also with government officials and HSC and people who are involved in, in the sector to try to make sense of what's uh, happened. So uh, here we have uh, in a table uh, how it has uh, uh, evolved. Uh, in financial terms. So from the years that are of interest, 2006 to 19, that's kind of when it really started to pick up. In the 90s and early 2000s, um, the private providers were there, but really not uh, as um, important as uh, they are today. So, um, if you look at the first line, home care packages, um, they have really risen. You can see uh, expenditure of 55 million here in 2006, and now we're at 150 or so uh, today. So it's really um, been more important. Uh, and that's where the private providers are operating really. So you can see how they, they grew out of that. Uh, home help. That's um, mostly HSC provision of home care. So you can see that it has increased a little bit from 185 to 2018 or so, uh, but it's not the same type of increase at all. So um, that's why you can see the, the, um, the establishment of the, uh, the private uh, providers um, over time. So the results in a nutshell are here. So we look at um, public spending. That means that the HSC is 
uh, providing money for delivery by themselves, by the HSC, or they pay uh, private providers or nonprofit providers. So it's formal home care that we're looking at. Uh, there is stuff that is going on beyond that, which I'm not looking at, which is uh, the private pay market. So let's say uh, I need the home care for my mother or something. Uh, I can contract with um, a private provider, Home Instead or Bluebird or something like that. I pay them directly and they give me care. Uh, that's not considered in any of this. Uh, so you could actually argue that private providers are even bigger than what I'm showing you because there's a private pay market as well. It's, there's less data on that, of course, but uh, so we're looking at the public spending, where it's going to so private provision, private provision, HSC provision, which is called direct provision or nonprofits. So from 2006, 19, the period that we're looking at the private providers uh, used to get 5% uh, of the total in 2006, and that has gone up to 40%. Uh, the HSC, conversely, has gone down 85% to 50%. So today, HSC is about 50%. The private guys, not 50%, but nearly there. The, the balance is to the nonprofits. In terms of absolute money uh, terms, so 3 million to 160. 76 million um, to the private providers and HSC provision you can see has risen but not the same type of uh, increase and the nonprofits them they have been stable 50 million but it's not like a decrease or an increase it's just a, a low uh, level of, uh, of spending on, on them so I have this in um, in um, graph form so the line at the top that's the total spending public spending on home care from 2006 to today so you can see it's kind of interesting uh in the middle portion it's a bit of a decrease or stable uh, trend that was during the austerity years and after that it really picked up uh well really picked up it doesn't mean that there's there's still a, needs that are not met, but uh, the trend is really up. And you can see uh, the private ones are here, the line that's going up at the bottom from very little in 2006, big increase um, over the last few years. And um, the corresponding um, line here, the dotted line, second one from the top is the HSC. So you can see there's a decrease there matched by an increase by the private provider. So you see the, the shift. And the bottom line, the solid line is uh, nonprofits. Um, so they, they are kind of stable um, and that's it. So um, if we uh, try to explain that in the terms that I've uh, talked about uh, earlier on, um, we can talk about structural um, factors. I won't talk too much about it because it's a bit more broad in the, in the, in the way that uh, it operates. So most of the market here in terms of the private providers, they're really dominated by uh, a few uh, global franchises. Uh, so global capital is very important. Think of Home Instead or Bluebird. Um, and Irish people might have a stake in this, like in terms of ownership, but it's really, they're global franchises. So they've really entered the market very strongly and they're really poised to increase. Like they're not on the downside at all. And in general, you can talk of neoliberal market policies in the country that have kind of allowed that, that uh, to happen, right? So that's the, the structural side. On the instrumental side, um, we can talk about the lobbying aspect, which is what instrumental is uh, referring to. Uh, Home and Community Care Ireland, so HCCI, they represent uh, most of the private providers. And uh, they've been quite good and organized uh, at, uh, you know, to promote their interests. And they've really increased and improved 
uh, in the last few years. So they have a new CEO, uh, Joseph Musgrave, who's really good at you know getting things going and uh, putting uh, the sector on you know on the map there. Uh, so. Uh, that it's not that they necessarily lobby like individual ministers and you know ask them do this or that it's more that they they are well organized to share data among themselves they have a better idea of their direction they want to take and uh that's from all i hear uh, it's been quite um, successful not i would argue the main um, driver between uh, behind their uh, their growth because that kind of came afterwards it's almost an effect of uh of the growth of the private providers that keeps going, that keeps that trend going, but um, we'll see what the drivers are in my view later. And at the very beginning in 2000, mid 2000s, maybe 2005, there was some early individual lobbying and action on the part of certain providers. Uh, so uh, maybe you could count that uh, instrumental uh, on the instrumental side. Now, if we look at institutional aspects, um, the notion of state restraint, or it's not very much withdrawal because the state has kept increasing uh, its uh, provision of home care, but uh, uh, it's more restraint we're talking about. Uh, a reluctance to expand to cover the demand, the needs um, that are, have arisen um, and there's a little bit of a debate here, which I'm not exactly clear yet about because people I talk to don't seem to be clear about it. And it's difficult to look at that issue is the issue of price. So um, is it that uh, the private providers are cheaper or is it more something organizational? Uh, so what seems to be the case so far is that um, the state uh, has, as a government official quote there uh, said, is that increasing the headcount in the public function, it, it's something that they've always been very cautious and careful about because they don't want to be stuck with all the pension costs, with the management of staff uh, that comes with having a big, uh, a larger uh, workforce in the public sector. So um, that's the that's the, the issue there uh, more i would say than um, operating costs you know like oh it's too expensive right now because the private providers are not always uh cheaper in in immediate terms anyway and so as the quote at the bottom it says by a private, private provider the hsc expanded throughout those years but um not enough uh, so it's not that they withdrew necessarily it's just that um, there was a restraint and really meeting all the needs and the private providers had a space to to fill that that gap really um, another reason why that is is that there's a flexibility in costs so and a government official said um, it's a nice quote i think so it's a big political issue to turn back the clock or freeze aspects of public sector pay if you've struck contracts and you've hired all those people, uh, you can't really just say, okay, now I don't need them or I need to save money, let's go back. So if you need to limit spending, it's really hard to, to do that. But if you have uh, private providers, then you can just tell them, listen, we don't have the money for now, uh, deal with it kind of thing. So it's kind of very flexible for uh, state, uh, officials who want to limit the budgets or for whatever uh, reason. Uh, there's a good quote here. Uh, I usually don't like to give long quotes because then people read and then it's a bit hard to, to absorb quickly, but uh, it's, we, we have to remember we are out of a period of austerity and that allowed somewhat the private providers to expand in some way. So there's a private provider who explained it. He said that the HSC people, they're really good, right? But uh, during the recession, uh, when the HSC was cutting back everywhere, the staff and all of that, uh, the HSC people were very overwhelmed, right? So it was just a bit, uh, they were very pressurized. And they really now, they appreciated when the private guys came in and uh, said, well, okay, we can help, we can you know, deliver some home care and uh, 
it will alleviate a bit of pressure. And that was a way for some private providers to kind of get in, especially in the private pay market or uh, on home care packages. Now, again, this is one person. Um, it's unclear to me to what extent that's the case, but I think it, it's really illustrative of uh, the trends in the last few years uh, when the state withdraws or restrains itself during austerity. Now, if we look at the delegation aspect, which is more of a conscious way, uh, intentional way for the state to push to, to outsource the services, there's a process of fiscalization that I think falls into that. This is just tax incentives for the private pay market. So I said I wouldn't talk about it too much, but in this case, it makes sense. The value of that is about uh, near 50 million a year. Uh, so that's really a conscious decision together with competitive tendering, which is how those monies are allocated in the uh, formal uh, home care, which is the stuff we talked about so far. Uh, so there is also a conscious decision, of course, to, to organize that market. So fiscalization, and really I should have written uh, competitive tendering, which is the whole framework for allocating uh, packages and private providers can um, uh, tender to that and they can be on the list and then uh, they are part of the um, potential uh, providers. Um, the other one, which is accretion, is more when, like I said, when the private providers are actually uh, of their own will really trying to push out the, the state. Uh, you could say here that, um, that um, one thing they did is that because they were very competitive and commercial minded, they kind of pushed their way and especially they pushed the nonprofits out a bit, which were less organized and for a big business type of uh, activity, less uh, efficient. Again, I'm careful when I say this, it's something I hear from many people. It doesn't mean that the nonprofits were you know, lazy or whatever. It just means that it le it's less commercial. And that apparently uh, from all accounts has really um, forced the nonprofits to adjust in that way. And there were early actions at the beginning by the, on the part of private providers to, to make their way into the market. But really, I would really downplay that. It's more that the state context of restraint was more, uh, made it favorable for them or possible for them to, to do that. Uh, the feedback mechanisms um, associated with the competitive tendering system, um, it has really benefited large for-profit providers over the nonprofits, as I said, but also over smaller private companies because with the tendering system, it's more systematic and it's a formal marketization and it comes with a lot of obligations to, uh, of regulation and only the big guys can really deal with that efficiently. The smaller ones, it's a bit of a burden all to fill all those regulatory uh, requirements. So there's one private provider who even said it, you see, private providers push a lot about for regulation and form fitting, fitting forms here and there, because they know that uh, the smaller, smaller players will be kept out. So it's a way to entrench their power. The system becomes more about regulation and tendering, and then it kind of strengthens even more the, the larger players uh, hand. Now, about the consequences of all that, so that's for the description and analysis of the growth and the reasons. Um, there's implications about the quality of care, which are quite difficult from what I can see to uh, measure, uh, even roughly in the case of home care. In the case of hospital care, you can always look at survival rates or discharge rates for certain types of procedures, but in the home care, it's a little bit more difficult to see if someone who's visited uh, by a carer to cook a meal or do some procedures, uh, you know, keeping the house well, how well that's done or if they interact together and it's a nicely conducted relationship or if it's not so much, it's a bit difficult, but you can have surveys on this, which I'm doing at the moment uh, from carers. Um, now, it seems that the private providers have a lower quality from my survey. I won't uh, state that uh, as a, you know, an absolute fact because it's kind of a perception study. Um, but that's 
kind of one issue anyway. If the private providers grow and grow, what does it mean for quality of care? And they will grow. Home care will grow now because of COVID, as I'll get into it, and uh, aging of the population. The other one is about working conditions in home care, but also it has effects, of course, over other sectors. Um, everybody agrees that working conditions in uh, the private sector um, are not as good as uh, the HSC, whether it's for uh, pension entitlements or work conditions in general, stability of employment. So um, again, that has a consequence for the, the sector as a whole. If you downgrade those conditions, then you have to, there'll be consequences uh, to that. Now I have a little uh, short slide on COVID uh, because it's still ongoing and it's not from what I see as if the sector has been completely reshaped because of COVID, right? There's been uh, transformations, but it's not uh, um, so fundamental. So very close, clo a closer relationship between the HSC and the private providers, um, which is maybe surprising, but they had to collaborate a lot to address um, the crisis with COVID. So um, what does that mean for the future? Well, who knows? Uh, but uh, you could say that they might even become a bit more the same. Maybe the HSC will become more commercial minded or maybe the private providers will adjust to HSC public uh, care requirements, um, but that's one factor. Um, and there's also an issue of consolidation. Like I was saying, there's been many uh, private providers, even in the years at the beginning, there were quite a few popping up here and there, kind of small operators. Now we're really moving towards the big providers um, um, controlling most of the market and the government prefers to deal with few big players than a large number of small players. As a code paradox, which I said I was asking for uh, advice from people in the, uh, who are listening, you maybe help me solve that paradox. I'm conducting a survey with uh, carers. And whereas before COVID, people, like I said, agreed that working conditions are better with the HSC, quality of care seems to be better, whatever people interpret it as. Uh, but during COVID, um, there, according to the answers I have, it, it seems that the HSC underperformed and private providers overperformed compared to expectations. So the two of them are seen as somewhat the same in terms of, it's not a perfect response, but it's not like a bad response. So it kind of goes against what we would see as, uh, what's expected, you know, that the HSC has more time, more resources, it's public and all that's commercial and all that. But uh, actually, I don't know why that's the case. Um, I've heard many answers. Uh, I won't go over them because they're all more individuals who told me what they thought, but that's one interesting one. Uh, and also there's geographical differences um, in, uh, in everything I've said. Some regions in Ireland uh, are more, have seen private providers grow more than others. And you have to, to look at how this is going to play out in the next few years, which, like I said, will witness most likely more interest in home care because of COVID people want to be treated at home and stay at home instead of going to nursing homes and because the population is aging as well so you have a demand for long-term care that's increased so uh just a conclusion to summarize um i would say actually deregulation is the most important together with delegation um that's what explains the mechanism why in ireland it has led to a growth of private providers uh, projection, uh, that's what I was saying, uh, in home care will become even more popular as a field of study and uh, as, a, as a service uh, because of COVID. Uh, Slauncher care also called for more uh, community-based type of care to um, alleviate the pressure uh, on, uh, on hospitals, for example. And um, there's a statutory scheme for home care, which Ireland is one of the few countries in, the, in Europe that doesn't have that. So there's no uh, entitlement, uh, formal entitlement. And now we've been promised a scheme, which everybody says it's not just a promise now, it will really happen. 
but with COVID, it has disturbed those plans a little bit. And a lot of it will uh, depend on that in the sense that um, that scheme will be shaped maybe by uh, by uh, the private guys or the public guys. So that's it. Uh, 